right. Oops. All right, good people. Uh, this is Charles Breeling, uh, also known as Flat Earth Math, uh, here with our uh, conversation with um, Kyle Adams. So let's bring on uh, on Kyle. Uh, hello, Kyle. Uh, thank you so much for hello. joining me this evening. Um, now, this evening, um, we're going to have Kyle is going to uh, kind of ask me some some questions, uh, take a little bit of a lead. He's had a couple interesting conversations with MC Tune and and Mr. Sensible, so I'm hoping to have a, a similarly uh, productive conversation with him. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, Kyle, take it away. All right, good to have you. Good to be back is what I wanna say. Uh, so my very first question that I asked Mr. Sensible and MC Tune was about the definition of science. Uh, yeah, how do you I, define the definition of science? Um, my, best, my best definition of science is it's a way to interrogate nature. And I know that sounds really harsh, but uh, but I, I like the, you know, I, I, I like the harshness of it because it's like, what is nature? Let's find out, you know, like and, and let's do it like no holds barred. So I like that phrase, interrogate nature. And then that could even apply to like something like a silicon uh, semiconductor factory where they're trying to find the best ways of laying, you know, laying silicon. Well, that's nature tells you how to lay silicon, you know, so you even, even, you know, advanced technology uses the fundamental rules of physics. Um, and so, yeah, uh, how to interrogate nature. Okay. Yeah. I've got it defined as systematized knowledge in general. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah. Systematized knowledge. Um, yes, but systematized knowledge could also apply to things like, I would say like history and literature. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, that's why no, no argument, no argument there. Yeah. That's why I've got on my art degree. It's, uh, it's a bachelor's of science in art. And it's just, that's kind of what I learned in my art process is it's all systematized knowledge. And that's right. why I was able to say that and describe it that way. Okay. Uh, Fair enough. Okay. So, uh, how do you define evidence? Yeah. Evidence, um, that's a good one. Um, I would think it would be uh, information gathered um, through either through observation or exploration or experimentation. Um, but and, and there's good evidence and bad evidence. So you could you can collect evidence very in a very sloppy fashion, in which case it probably wouldn't hold up in an argument or a court of law. But I would say that that to have uh, good evidence that 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 uh, holds its ground, you, you need to be rigorous in in the methodology that you use to collect it. Uh, I know that's a whole lot of words, but basically, you know, collecting information, whether it's it's through the natural world or or the or or even like a, a court of law, whether it's you know video surveillance of a crime or something, um, but done in a, in a in a in a rigorous or a systematic way to to have more weight. But you can have bad evidence. It's just you know, you're not going to, you're not going to convince anybody with bad evidence. Okay. So do you agree with it just being a indication or sign of something? Uh, the definition that the dictionary gives me uses the example of this lady looked really flush and that was evidence of a fever. Yeah. I, I remember you saying that um, I, I would, I would push back on that a little bit because the lady could have looked very flush because she came in from a cold winter's day. Um, yeah. and, 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 and her face is sort of adjusting to the change in temperature. She could look very flushed because she just got embarrassed, you know? Yeah. So there's a lot of different reasons why she could have looked flushed. Yeah. I think and, that's why it's kind of a significant definition here is because it's not exactly proving that this is the case. It's just an indication that this could be one of many different reasons. And so, right. Just, and, yeah. and the other an thing that comes to mind is actually a magician, you know, if a magician, does something uh, pulls a rabbit out of a hat that was evidence that there was a uh, a rabbit that was in his hat the whole time and and we all know that no the the rabbit wasn't in the hat the whole time there was a little switcheroo at the last second and yeah. you know so but then again i i don't really have a big qualm with 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 that definition of evidence okay all right so um we've talked about science we've talked about evidence uh, the other question I bring up is a lot of people say that flat earthers are anti-science. Are you one of those people or are you uh, kind of, where do you stand on that? What does that mean to you? If that, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, well, the 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 word, the phrase that that really bothers me the most among Globers is um, is science denier. I know that's that's sort of like the phrase du jour, and that that phrase really really bugs me because it has at its core Holocaust denier. That's where it comes from. But that's uh-huh. not what that wasn't your question. Um, you said anti science. I don't believe um, flat earthers are anti science. I believe that flat earthers um, have faith have faith that they know the shape of the earth being flat. And this faith causes them to reject evidence that I, I feel is valid uh, as a globe birther. Um, and I don't think that's anti-science. I, I just think it's because, and, and you know, you're a man of faith. I'm a man of faith. And, and I've, I've talked about, about this with my, with my brethren at the, at the church and mm-hmm. talking about how I couldn't, lay out a series of facts that prove the, 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 um, that God doesn't exist to, to one of my fellow church members. Um, that person would nod and smile and, and say, okay, th- those facts seem very interesting, but at the end of the day, their, their faith in God is not going to be shaken by my facts. Um, and, and like, I mean, and, you know, you being a man of faith and me being a man of faith, I mean, you could, you can come up with all kinds of facts that disprove the existence of, of God. And you're not going to be swayed because you have faith that God exists as do Uh I. And so with regards to your question, I believe that people who, who believe the earth is flat, um, there, it it is a, it, it is a belief structure such that if you come up with facts that show the earth is a globe, well, that those facts can be kind of explained away you know, refraction, uh, the perspective or, you know, any of the number of of reasons to explain away those facts. Uh, So Mm -hmm. I don't think it's anti-science at all. I just think it's it's just being able to selectively kind of, you know, reject evidence. Okay. because like I said, some evidence is bad. And so flat earthers may say, well, this evidence you're coming to me, that's bad evidence, like 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 photos of the moon landing. You may say, well, that was faked. So therefore, I'm just going to reject your evidence. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, I disagree with that. I, I believe that evidence is real, but you know, uh-huh. but that's not, it's not anti-science to say, I'm just rejecting this evidence. And I won't, I won't say that it's not evidence. There's different kinds of evidences out there. Uh, I liked what my, my daughter's uh, history book talked about when it came to evidence and about with uh, artifacts, there's like firsthand evidence of something that was directly left behind. And then there's secondhand evidence. And uh, it, it's kind of uh, like when you're talking in, in a, when you're writing a book, there's first person and third person perspectives. And mm-hmm. it kind of works the same way with evidence. And the, the more direct from the source you can get, the stronger the evidence is. And so, it, yeah, that's kind of how it goes. It doesn't, it's not just a, this is evidence. Therefore it's all proven fact. Right. 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 And, that way. And, and that's, and that's one of the focuses of, or foci uh, of my channel is, is that uh, I try to get people to, to go out and collect their own uh, observations. And, and I always joke with people. I say, you know, what, regardless of what you conclude, <clears throat> regardless of what you conclude, whether the earth is a globe or the earth is flat, the evidence you gather using my experiments is yours to keep. Um, because, you know, and, and we've had this conversation, uh, Kyle, where where you say, well, you're really relying on light traveling in straight lines. And, and mm-hmm. I think that's probably our number one point of disagreement. Um, but I always joke with people. I say, you know, if you go outside, you make these careful measurements. I don't care what you conclude. The evidence is yours to keep. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Just to kind of encourage people just to get out there and make the measurements anyway. You know? Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, so you've got. Flat Earth Math, that's your name here, but it's not necessarily your stance. It's not a proclamation saying that you are a Flat Earther. And so, it, it's right. a tiny bit of clickbait, okay? And I, I, I'm just going to come out and say it. It's a little bit of a clickbait title. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, so with a hypothesis, that's my next question is, how much evidence do you think is required in order to form a hypothesis? Oh, I, I would say none. I would say a hypothesis in, is an educated guess. Um, focuses on the educated part, but um, you know, it, sometimes a, a guess could be like a shot in the dark. 
but sometimes it could be, oh, we've observed a hundred different things and I'm going to come up with a hypothesis that kind of agrees with those hundred different things. Okay. So that would be a, a more rigorous evidence-based hypothesis, but your starting point, you know, anybody can make a hypothesis about anything at any time, but you know, I mean, uh, somebody could make a hypothesis that, that, um, you know, the moon is made of cheese and there's no indication that the moon is made of cheese. There's zero evidence of it, you know, um, but, but that could be a hypothesis and now whether you can test it or not, you know, is another story, but, yeah. but you could make a hypothesis not based on evidence, but the better hypothesis are the ones that are, that are educated, educated guesses focus on the educated. Yeah. I, I like to say a, a good hypothesis is built on a foundation of observation and experimentation. There's gotta be something that kind of indicates uh, the results on what you're uh, hypothesizing there. Right. So I th think that would be the differentiation between a good hypothesis and a bad hypothesis. Right. And you could have, you know, properly worded and I, I'm, you know, my expertise is not on like logic and rhetoric and, and the structure of these things. I, I, I just like to observe things. I, I like geometry. And so I like to just kind of think about the shape of the earth, think about geometry and think about like what observations can you make? Um, and I know that, that some people really focus in on like the, the logical structure of the argument. And I think sometimes that, that can muddy the waters a little bit because it's like, you know, I, I, I don't really, I don't have a very strong background in like logical argument structure. Um, yeah. So I, I try to, um, you know, kind of go with my gut a little bit, but so it's like, you know, there's probably a formal definition of a hypothesis uh -huh. and, and I, I'm just, you know, I don't really emphasize that. Yeah. Well, the main thing that I really focus on is, uh, the way I see things is everything is built line upon line and precept upon precept here, here a little and there a little. Right. And so I, I think all truth comes together into one great whole. That's a, a big, strong yeah, belief of mine. And so with, when it comes to science, I just see it as finding all of the puzzle pieces and finding, uh, and recognizing the concept concepts, yeah, re recognizing the concept con complex concepts. Sorry, the recognizing the complex concepts and looking for the the basic concepts each of those con complex concepts are built upon, and then trying to build up from that. So kind of starting from a foundation and then slowly adding upon that. Sure, I, I would I would agree with that. That okay, so. Okay. Yeah, based on everything we've talked about so far, I, I don't see anything that you disagree with with when it comes to that very first video. It's just um, well, if it says if it's lesson number one, because I, I went back and I watched it, is lesson number one what it's what what it's called the greatest, you know, the the or the, the the greatest proof of flat Earth or the greatest something greatest evidence. The, the greatest, greatest evidence, evidence of the flat Earth is the is the evidence that starts you on your journey. Okay. Yeah. And that's where I disagree with you. That's okay. I, everything else you've set up to now. I a hundred percent agree with you, but, okay. but the, but the idea that the greatest evidence is the thing that starts you on your journey. I have a huge disagreement with uh cheerful disagreement. To, that's can right. I elaborate? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Cause so for starters, I'm a huge fan of magic. Um, uh -huh. Penn and Teller, like Penn and Teller fool us. Um, I, I think is a fantastic show. I, I've loved all the magicians they've had on, America's Got Talent and those various other shows. Um, although I don't like the camera editing in America's Got Talent because they they literally will deceive the audience with camera tricks. Where uh, Penn and yeah. Teller, you know, Penn and Teller, they've uh, got a the Carbonaro effect. I don't know if you've seen. Oh, that the Carbonaro one. effect. Yeah, and 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 yeah. they use There's they use camera, camera editing as well. So if you're if you're watching the Carbonaro effect and trying to be like, I want to see the magic trick, you're not going to see the magic trick because they, they they cut it all together. So yeah, what what that, Michael that Carbonaro does I, looks I, magic. Like I used to really like the Carbonaro effect until I figured out the camera trick thing. It was like that just spoils everything. <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah. yeah, which is one of the reasons why I really really like the Penn and Teller show and that they are genuinely trying to portray an act with no camera tricks because and and the magician like I've actually uh, done a bit of digging behind the scenes. Um, and and uh, they, they they try to prevent present an honest show. Penn and Teller do not know how the trick was done beforehand, 
Um, and sometimes they're fooled, sometimes they're not. Now, what, how does this relate to your lesson number one? Okay. You could watch a magic, and, and I've seen some magicians on Penn and Teller that are just jaw droppingly like the, I would think they're a wizard, right? Uh -huh. uh, one guy that comes to mind is Shin Lim. Uh, Shin Lim does things with cards that are that break the laws of physics. Okay, I'm just going to uh -huh. put it out there. So if I watch Shin Lim and I can see a couple things that he's doing, I, I, I know a couple sleight of hand moves that he's doing, but the rest of his act, like the, the other three quarters of his act, it's wizardry. Okay, so I could see his act and say, and can come to the conclusion that Shin Lim is a wizard. <laughs> okay, he is okay. violating the laws of physics. Now, that could start me on my journey about wizardry. And it's like, but that's not the greatest evidence that wizardry exists. That's uh -huh. that's a starting point, but that's not evidence that wizardry exists. That's something to pique my my interest. And then maybe I'll get a bunch of books on magic and, and Shin Lim literally sells his, his, his stuff. Like you could buy his routine and he will uh -huh. show you behind the scenes, the magician's eye view of everything he does. And it's like, oh, it's just a trick. You know, uh -huh. it's just a trick. It looked like wizardry, but it turns out it's just a trick, you know? And so, so I, that's why I would push back. I would say that's, that's not the greatest evidence that might start you on your journey, uh -huh. but it's not evidence for your journey being in the right direction. It doesn't. Yeah. Sense. Obviously it doesn't validate the journey. It just, it's something that kind of catches your mind and it, yeah, it's the brain tickler, I guess you could say. Um, but, you know, and I think your your lesson number one focuses on the flat horizon, if I'm not mistaken. The, the that was, that was evidence is... number one is just kind of looking yeah. at a, a flat horizon and right. just saying, OK, well, that looks flat. Is there a reason for that? And that was uh, yeah, one of the major emphasis there. Yeah. So so I would say, you know, alternative hypothesis. We live on a huge planet, you know, <laughs> so the horizon will look flat, you know, and go on from there. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's totally okay. That as I talk about in some of the later videos that uh, it's not just this hypothesis and that is it, but there's also a rivaling hypothesis. And then we have to kind of bounce back and forth between the two, the two rivals. <laughs> so yeah. It kind of yeah. makes it a little bit more fun. <laughs> and, and if you don't mind, um, I, I'm going to just put a comment on the screen real quick um, by the Adam Meekin. Uh, there is a scientific definition of hypothesis, perhaps, for you to move forward with credibility, you should understand and value it. And, and I'm just going to tell you, uh, Mr. Meekin, I, um, my focus is on, on, on just getting outside and using a little bit of geometry. And it's like, I, I don't focus on the argument side because like you could have a debate between two masters of, of, of logic and rhetoric. And like one person may be better at logic and rhetoric than the other. And so like, oh, we're well, going to say this person wins the debate, even though the other person's argument was actually true. You know, so but, yeah, I uh, think that's where I like to focus, put the focus on finding common ground with someone. Uh, you're, if you've just started a debate and you start throwing things around, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean someone's mind gets changed. And that I think that's right there is that should be the focus of a, of a debate is to try and change someone's mind. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with the phrase steel manning an argument? Mm, is that the the phrase is that I'm thinking of steel and just being strong. And so I'm thinking yes. that's like standing with your argument, no matter what. No, um, the, the you're very familiar with straw man argument because you, you've yes. done a whole thing on, on logical fallacies. So mm -hmm. obviously a straw man is where you, you point your finger at your opponent and you say, you know, well, so I'm going to say to you, the earth can't be flat because there are hills and valleys. Mm -hmm. And well, that wasn't your argument. Right. I just straw manned yeah. you because you never claimed there weren't hills and valleys. Right. Yeah. So I just straw manned you. So steel manning is the exact opposite of that. That's where you point your finger at your opponent, not accusingly, and you try to articulate your opponent's argument as well as he would. OK, uh -huh. so I might point my finger at you and I say, you know, you believe that we do not live on a spheroid shaped planet you believe that the earth is more shaped like a like a pizza than it is a ball mm -hmm. and and i think that's probably what you believe right yeah it, that the, the earth is more like a pizza than a ball right mm -hmm. um so i just steel manned you in that 
that that is what you believe right uh and wow. so it's like steel manning is like you know you really you're talking about common ground where you're really trying to establish common ground with people where it's okay. like what so, are the points of what are the points of agreement you know um so yeah there's a, a there's a thing called active listening and that's kind of what it sounds like you're describing is active mm -hmm. listening where mm -hmm. i kind of ask you questions is this kind of what you're describing and and then i try to build off of that yeah yeah um so but but going more than active listening and, and actually and actually articulating your opponent's argument um in mm -hmm. a way that is that is true and not cartoonish because yeah. you know that and happens I think that's all the, the important time. that's right. the important thing is to actually check for understanding make sure my understanding is correctly because if i'm not then i you know i, I don't want to be creating a big straw man argument here and it's i think when you jump into that it can quickly turn into a straw man if you're not careful so um and there's a great story about um abraham lincoln who used to be a a, a trial lawyer uh -huh. and one of his techniques uh in closing argument and and i forget who goes first but in closing argument he would lay out step by step the opposing counsel's argument and of course he would re refute them point by point by point because he wanted to win the case but like then the then the opposing counsel would get up and he'd have nothing to say because abraham lincoln had already articulated every single one of the points so uh yeah it's kind of interesting yeah that's something that uh i was taught to do whenever i write a persuasive essay is to try and include opposing arguments in that essay and that ends up up uh, you, if you bring up the argument before they do, then that just gives more power to your essay. Right, right. Yeah. So I um, there's actually a couple um people I just want to give a shout out to uh, to Zulu one in the in the chat. Uh, thank you very much for your presence. And I and I also want to say to everybody else in the chat, I I do apologize. I am focusing on on the conversation with Kyle, and I and I apologize that I'm not addressing a lot of the things that are in the chat. So I, if you if you bring a comment up. And it just scrolls by. I I apologize. I can't get to your comments because I'm I'm focused on on Kyle here, but I do appreciate the comments. Okay, so uh, based on everything in the video, that's the one thing that you disagree with, right? That's, that's um, something else. Or yeah. Is there anything else? Well, I mean, obviously, I, I have a little bit of problem with the methodology that that you used in in, and I think it might have been the second the second video of lesson one, which was the scrunch. Oh yeah, um, the scrunch horizon. That's... Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. and um, and also it looks like um, if the curved horizon, like let's say a glober says, all right, here, here, this picture showing a curve, it seemed to me that that if the curve was sort of um, asymmetrical, meaning it was going down further on one side, um, that if you scrunch the the part that is like 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 here then mm -hmm. that looks flat. But then if you scrunch this one, then that looks curved. Even though if you look at the entire thing, if you scrunch the entire thing, you get a nice curve. Uh, yeah. So I, you know, I can nitpick your, your methodology there, but I, yeah, yeah. you know, I'd like but to, so, yeah. I'd like to talk about that one more in detail uh, in the in a, future where we can actually have pictures. Yeah, I think that one's a video that is going to require some kind of a, a pictures to kind of reference to not me just waving my arm around is that this isn't very yeah, it's good. kind of hard <laughs> yeah because i remember i brought that up with mr sensible and he actually uh talking about that i was like oh wow you're totally right i i learned something and i i always enjoy learning something as as do i in fact that's one of the things that i i love about the flat earth debate and i don't know if i've ever said this to you kyle um i've learned more math and physics and science and technology in the past, you know, 10 years of, of, of being engaged in the flat earth debate than I had in like the previous 10 years. I um, hear you. Yeah. You know, cause well, like, for example, you know, gyros, gyros on small aircraft, how do they work? How come, you know, how come you can fly a plane long distance and the gyro doesn't show you, you know, doing something crazy. And it's like, all right. So I found out what the mechanism is. I didn't know, you know, so it's like, I learned something new. Yeah, there's so, a, yeah. Th the whole thing is before it, you never needed it. And the moment you needed it, that's what kind of turns on the fire and it's like, wow, I got to learn everything about this now. And right. then that's where the education comes. But if you don't need it, who need, <laughs> why bother with learning about it? You know what I mean? Because one of the things that I really appreciate in this debate is when flat earthers bring up um, 
bring up ideas that I don't really know a whole lot about. Like, for example, um, the the Coriolis effect and then uh, Foucault's pendulum. Like I, I did a, a deep dive into Foucault's pendulum, um, deriving all sorts of equations. And and, um, and it's like I, and I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have you know been able to dive into that had somebody not been talking about, oh, Foucault's pendulum you know, it doesn't make any sense. And it's like, so I, I figured it out and, and, uh, was able to research it and I learned a lot and yeah, it was really, it was really fascinating. Yeah. I did, uh, I've been doing a, I've been trying to take my channel to the next level. And so one of the major ways I've been trying to do that is to get out and talk to more people. And so I, one of my goals is to go and talk to every single university in Utah and <laughs> talk to the in, interview, the professors over there and see what they have to say about things. Uh, Cause that's something I don't see anyone else out there doing. And, yeah. Uh, so I actually got the chance to go to one prominent university and talk to someone recently about this whole uh, Coriolis effect observations that I, I did a video on previously. And uh, I'll be getting my video out tonight on what observations oh. I was do because I got to use their lab. I got to use their equipment and we did some major experiments and they were huge. And so cool. I'm really excited to get that published tonight. Neat. Neat. <laughs> Sounds exciting. Yeah. So uh, that kind of wraps up most of my questions here. I can't think of any, anything that I'm missing, but uh, yeah, you can feel free to ask away okay. questions if you've got anything you'd like to say. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, your uh, well, channel uh, comments. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I do want to re respond to, to, to some of the, to some of the comments, but, um, I, I, I just want to say, and I'm, I'm not going to give it away because I, I want to produce a video. I, I'm, I'm, I'm working on the script for it now, but I want to say Kyle, that you are the inspiration to an entire new, uh, line of thinking of mine as a Glober, uh, to try to, uh, bridge the gap between, flat earthers and, and globe earthers. Um, and it's your comment about, you know, that, that my experiments require, um, light to go in a straight line or, you know, mm -hmm. and so, um, and you really got me thinking, uh, I, 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 you really got me thinking and I, and I, and I, I sort of kind of went back to the drawing board and, and so my new approach, I, I'm still a glober, but my new approach, I think, may um may cause the wheels to turn in some flat earthers minds and okay you know it's like uh i i, I just I, I like to present things in a way that that you know will cause people to think just like you you caused me to to think about that um because I, I just watched this this really interesting presentation uh it was down in brazil it was a conference down in brazil but it was by a guy who's been studying a, a flat earth uh, believers. He's been to a mm -hmm. bunch of flat earth conferences. He's interviewed, he's interviewed Mark Sargent. He's interviewed some of the top flat earth folks. Um, and, uh, oh, hello. Uh, <laughs> um, hello, Jim Jackson. Um, <laughs> howdy. Um, and so this, uh, um, this man down in Brazil, um, he, he really articulated that like the flat earth debate is really a matter of people not like pointing at each finger, pointing fingers at each other and, and yelling at each other and calling each other names and saying, you know, well, you're an, you believe the earth is light. You're an idiot. You know, it's like, how many people there are you going to, how many people are you going to convince with that? You know? Yeah. Um, and so he said, it's about people. It's about making a connection between, between people. So what I'm going to do is in the show notes uh, for this conversation, I will post a link to that. I don't have the link offhand. Uh, but I will post a link in the um, in the description of this video uh, to that to that. It's like a 90 minute presentation by a guy who's who's studied the flat earth debate. And but just from a from the perspective of like, why do people believe things that the rest of the society doesn't believe? Um, a, sounds like an interesting. Uh, is, it, is it a book or a video? No, no, it, it's it's a video. It's a it's oh. a like a 90 minute conference talk, but it was a very small room. It was like a room with maybe maybe 15 participants, but it uh -huh. was of a conference down in Brazil, some one, some university in Brazil that was, um, I guess the focus is on, was on, um, not why people believe strange things, but like something along the lines of, 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 um, uh, alternative beliefs that some people have. I mean, one of the things they mentioned was, you know, anti, anti-vaxxers or, 
people who believe in chemtrails or or 9-11 truthers or whatever. And then so, mm -hmm. but the focus was on flat earth, uh, focus yeah. of this guy's talk. So Sounds um, interesting. Yeah. Uh, what you're talking what you're talking about reminds me of a book that I read in college that uh, my business professor, he really encouraged and like we spent the whole semester really just talking about this little tiny book called City of Influence. And okay. uh, it's all about establishing uh, relationships with people and building upon those. Mm -hmm. And that's what business is really all about is just it's all about relationships. And if you can get that one key principle down, then your business will flourish. Yeah. Cause it's, it's, you know, it's like, unless you're a hermit, you know, you're living like castaway, you know, you've got your, 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 um, you're living on a, on a beach and you eat coconuts and stuff. Like, unless you're that guy, you know, we have to deal with people. We have to, you know, we have to deal with each other. And, and that's why I really, um, don't appreciate the approach a lot of Globers take, you know, where where they participate in the flat earth debate, a, a, a number of them, not all of them, but a number of them. Um, they participate in the debate for sport, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, 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 and I think that's kind of cruel, you know, because, uh -huh. Kyle, you're an actual human being. You're, you're not just some cartoon character that that people can throw darts at, you know, and I and, and I think to treat you as anything less than a human being with, you know, we disagree about the shape of the earth. Okay. But you're still a human being, you know? Um, yeah. and so, so I, that, that's the, the approach I've always tried to take. And I, I haven't been always a hundred percent successful, but I, I, you know, never try to, you know, have, have yelling and profanity and name calling. And, um, and so it's unfortunate that there's a lot of that on, on, on both sides sometimes. Yeah. But, sometimes uh, people can get really, uh, dramatic about all these things. And I think that, right there was always a very kind of shocking thing to me is it's like, really, it's someone's really going to get that hyped up and dramatic over science, like the shape of the earth and geology. Like I just think about rocks here. I can't <laughs> yeah, just getting all, all way up and crazy over a rock. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it, it, the thing is it's very offensive. Like I, I I've got to come clean here. Uh, I take some opinions that are not shared with many, many of my global friends. And I uh -huh. think a lot of my global friends are, are kind of establishment types, you know? Yeah. So if it's like, if it's the establishment presentation, um, I, I think a lot of my global friends that they, they, that's, that's what they, you know, that's what they go with. Like, and it seems so, almost like closed minded, like, you know, a, a big, a big debate is, is whether men should participate in women's sports. You know, there was uh -huh. a very prominent, uh, I forget the guy's channel, but very prominent guy who, 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 um, debated with flat earthers and he ha has a lot of funny, you know, uh, conversations on his channel, but, but they were almost religious about if a, if a man says that he's a woman, then he's a woman. And he has every right to participate in women's sports. And it's like, and the concept that that would be unfair was so foreign. But, you know, I'm going against the grain. Like the, the mainstream science says that if you're a man and you say that you're a woman, you're a woman. Like, period. I mean, even the Scientific American says that. And they uh -huh. used to be a, you know, a respectable science magazine. Uh, yeah. So it's like, I, I definitely am on the outside of, of certain topics. Um, it's amazing just how much politics are in on in all of the, all of this. Yeah, yeah, it's it's unfortunate because it's like I, I I believe in the truth, you know. It's like where's where is the truth, you know? Um, but but so many so many times there are certain conversations, like for example on on YouTube, you know, you can't talk about the the V A C. I'm not even going to spell oh, it. Yeah, you yeah, know the yeah, word yeah, you with regards because that's, that's you know like with regards to the current. <laughs> situation here in 2021 yeah. like you can't even make a video discussing that uh, I, i'll just refer to them as controversial injections <laughs> right right or medical well, I was, injections I, I was I, and i hope to have a conversation with um a really f nice fellow uh, i can science that um are you familiar with his channel um i can his, science that no i, I, I can science yet. that is the name of his channel really really friendly guy but he and i are on opposite ends of the spectrum uh politically uh -huh. And, uh, um, 
I, so I was thinking about having a conversation with him on this topic. And what I would say was taking a vacation. That's, that would be my phrase. You know, I, I, I want everyone to take a vacation. No, you can't force me to take a vacation. So that's how we would use code words to, to, yeah. <laughs> to have that conversation. Anyway, um, yeah, I do have a green screen. Um, this is a um, uh, green screen behind me. So I, I can move my camera and the, and the thing doesn't, uh, <laughs> the background doesn't move. Yeah. Um, well, it's better to have the wall in back of you instead of in front of you. <laughs> oh, this is true. This is true. And we've got a number of comments, uh, Kyle, um about the uh the gleason's map behind you um yeah everyone's gonna ask about australia and if i think that's the accurate shape of australia and and i acknowledge that there are some flaws in the in the gleason's map i don't expect it to be perfect but yeah i think it's more accurate than a globe map for example yeah well it's it's interesting because i i i'm i'm not a hundred percent sure that gleason was a flat earther because I actually have a book that was written by him that really comes out and acknowledges that. And that's oh, really? one of the things I'd love to do. Uh, it's on my list of, I've got over 20 ideas of future okay. ideas. And one of those ideas is uh, flat earth history. Who was Alexander Gleason? And uh, I've got his book on uh, is the world a globe. And uh, I think that was the title of it. Uh, there's uh, there's like, there's two books in one. I've got an e-file of it. And so I can give you a link to that if you want. Uh, but one of my goals is, uh, as I keep trying to invite other people to, if they want to come and participate, is if you could just read that book on, on YouTube and just talk a little bit about it every once in a while, boom, that's it'll be something. And that's uh, if you're looking for content, there's no end of content when it comes to uh, Flat Earth or anything. Interesting. Really. Now you get one video done, and then all of a sudden, ten more will come piling up on top of it. Um, because it, it, what's interesting about that about that map, um, you know, the technical name of that projection is the azimuthal equidistant um, uh, projection, and uh -huh. there's a, a an online um, you can go to a website that'll produce at, uh, azimuthal equidistant projections of anywhere in the world. And mm -hmm. the the reason why that projection was invented, because, you know, the cartographers always have all these these projections to to uh, for various purposes. But the purpose behind that projection was for things like radio stations and airports where, you know, obviously the airport has a fixed location, but it wants to know where are all the other airports and how far are they and in which direction? Same mm -hmm. thing with a radio station. Like if you have a radio station antenna, you're very interested in like, what's the distance to the nearest cities and, and, you know, what's the distance and what's the azimuth, what's the, the, the direction. And so yeah. what that projection does, the AE projection is it, it maintains perfect distance from the center of the map and perfect uh, azimuths. So mm -hmm. if you establish the North pole to be the center of the AE projection, um, and then you extend it all the way out to the, the South pole, then that is a 100% accurate AE projection map, <laughs> mm -hmm. if, if that makes sense. So if yeah. you start at the North Pole, literally every country, city, river, everything is the accurate distance from the North Pole and uh -huh. at the accurate azimuth, uh -huh. uh, which is a really, it's, I think it's fascinating that, 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 it, that what you have behind you is accurate in, in a sense. That's a good uh, common ground to have. <laughs> yes, yes. There's actually a video and I, I, you know, I've been a, a, off the flat earth debate for a couple of years now, but they, but there's this video somebody made where they took the AE projection and they literally using CGI, they wrapped a sphere with it. Cause you know, how you could wrap things in, in three dimensional space in the mind of a computer, it's called texturing. And so they, they literally took a, a, a 3d sphere and they took the AE map and they just wrapped it. And what they ended up with was a <laughs> nearly perfect globe. Uh, it was pretty funny. Okay. Um, a, a question just kind of came across my sure. mind here. Um, before you said you disagreed with that one part, which was the greatest evidence for a flat earth. Yes. As I just said, the, the evidence that starts you on your journey. Um, what would you say, what would you say is the greatest evidence of, of the flat earth for you? Oh, oh, the greatest evidence of the flat earth. If, the, yeah, if it's um, not that, then there's gotta be something else. No, no, no. Um, uh, so 
<laughs> it's interesting because like now that you you challenged me on that, I, I would agree with you. Um, but then uh, let me have a caveat. Okay, so what's the greatest evidence for a flat earth? Uh, we see flat horizons. Um, we don't feel motion. Um, we don't feel like we're spinning, wobbling, hurtling through space. Um, the stars don't appear to change, you know, year to year. I mean, obviously the stars are rotating, yeah. but the stars okay. don't appear to change year to year. So clearly we're not moving through space. Um, and then even when you get up as high as like a, an airplane flight, if you look down, like if you have a flight over water, like, like say you're flying over the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean and you look down and you see the surface of the water, the water looks perfectly flat. Um, mm -hmm. So I would say all those things put together, um, you know, I would say, you know, flat horizons, flat looking water, no sense of motion. I, I would say all these things are, are evidence uh, that could support uh, the, the flat earth hypothesis. Okay. All right. And now can I have the caveat? Yeah, go for it. Then you start your, your exploration. Like then uh -huh. you start your investigation and then hopefully you will discover that the evidence doesn't end there. Every single thing I just named is 100% consistent with the heliocentric model. Uh -huh. uh, and so what you thought was evidence for a flat, just like the guy pulling the rabbit out of the hat, what you thought was evidence that there was this, this rabbit that was magically in this hat. Um, what you thought was evidence is actually not evidence at all because literally everything, every single thing I just mentioned is completely consistent with the current heliocentric model. Uh, and that there's a bunch of evidence that is only possible in the heliocentric model and disqualifies the flat earth. Yeah. But, uh, and I think yeah. that's kind of the the thing here that I kind of strive to, to find and look for is uh, there's one absolute truth. And that means that we can't have two pictures that everything matches up perfectly with. Would you agree with that? Um, so I'm talking about like built, getting the bigger picture in general. And so if I were to collect the entire big picture, one picture has to have a uh, contradiction. It's got to contradict itself somewhere. Um, another picture wouldn't. The, the true one wouldn't contradict. I, okay. Okay. Yes. If, 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 you, if you say the true one would not have those contradictions built in, yes. I, I thought what you were going with was that every picture is going to have some sort of inherent flaws. And then I would, I would just remind you of the, the relativity of wrong essay by Isaac Asimov. And I will link that in the description of this video. Uh, but no, that's not what you were saying. You were saying if you have two pictures and then and one's true and one's false, then at some point, if you investigate deeply enough, you'll find contradictions in the false one that won't happen in the true one. And then yeah. I, I think I think that's 100 percent correct. OK, good. That's uh, I think part of what makes this journey so interesting. And, and when the Jehovah's Witnesses come and knock on my door. That's one thing I, I really enjoy doing with them is because I feel like they've got an entirely different picture than I'm looking at. And so I'm like, okay, well, I want to try and look for anything that contradicts themselves. And so I always enjoy talking with them. And it's, I just say, any excuse to study the Bible is a good excuse in my home. And so I just invite them in and, right. and I really do my best to, uh, to seek first to understand and then to be understood. And as I go ahead and, and I strive to do that, I've noticed that I can't get very far with them until they turn around and, well, what do you believe in? And I was like, well, I'll tell you what I believe in, but what I want to know is what you guys believe in. That's why you're here, right? <laughs> and so, but I, I've never been able to finish a book uh, with them. Uh, they're, they're, uh, what does the Bible really teach book? I've never been able to finish that book with them because it always ends up turning around to them talking to me about what I believe in. And then I have to talk into them. And I've had some really great, really strong and powerful experiences and just talking with them about that. And yeah, then all of a sudden, yeah, they talk about what I believe in and, uh, and that's one thing I really enjoy about all of this is as I learn about other people's beliefs, it helps me to have a better understanding of what I believe in. And it helps me to mm -hmm. find a need for a lot of different passages that I never really found a need for before. There's like Isaiah, for example, there's a lot of Isaiah passages that uh, were just interesting, but it was just kind of one more little thing on the shelf over there, but until I actually needed it, you know, I just look at it and 
as kind of a tool that has just been collecting dust forever. And so once I actually get to pick up the tool and use it, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So I guess it can, it kind of works that way with, uh, with the flat earth and globe earth as well Is I, as you were talking about, you've learned so much in, uh, since picking this up because you found a lot of these little tools on the shelf that you never had a use for before, but all of a sudden now, you do so and also invented i invented a number of like actual measuring tools uh, uh -huh. that that you know because like the focus of my channel is getting out in your own backyard and it's like i don't say all right go out and purchase a a theodolite you know drop drop twelve hundred dollars on a theodolite you know it's like no but you could make something that may you know help you at measure an azimuth you know with a couple yardsticks from home depot you know yeah so yeah um, so let's, uh, let's take a look at some of these, uh, some of the comments. I, uh, uh, <laughs> all right, spare, or, uh, surf, uh, uh, I'm probably mispronouncing it. There isn't any evidence for a flat earth, so they can't be the greatest evidence, uh, smiley face. Um, <laughs> well, that's why we established what evidence means. And so, yeah, yeah, that's what, that's, that's why that question is so, uh, foundational for me is we can't say there is no evidence when uh when there is indicators or signs that this could be the case that's why different people believe in it and so uh one thing i bring up i brought up with i think it was mc tune i talked to, to him a little bit about that and it's like well we've got the ancient mayans and aztecs and all these other ancient cultures that believed in a flat earth and so if you were to say there is no evidence, well, why did so many of those people believe it? Was there nothing that led them to believe in that? And so that those little tiny observations that you're talking about, such as observing flat horizons, those are all indications. And that's kind of the primary reason why so many of these ancient cultures believed the things that they did. Yeah, I and I would push back a little bit on that because I, I did a little bit of digging. Uh, I, I, I forget which conversation you were having. It might have been with MC Tune about the Aztecs. And I just looked up, you know, Aztecs and flat earth, or, or I forget what I, I, or what did Aztecs believe the shape of the earth were? And apparently they didn't, they didn't think about the shape of the earth at all. They had uh, a Mayans, very, uh, very, Mayans were much more strong about that. Okay. But the Aztecs had a very, very keen understanding of, of astronomy uh -huh. and, um, and the Aztecs being that they're so far South, I mean, much further South than you or I, they saw a lot more of the sky than than you or I do, and of course they didn't have any light pollution. Um, but and I haven't really rigorously researched this, but it seems to me that if somebody was not a, somebody, if a culture, an ancient culture, was not a seafaring culture, so the mm -hmm. ancient Egyptians, the 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 Mayans, the Aztecs, um, they were not great seafaring cultures. Uh, they they had their civilization, but they didn't send ships across the Pacific Ocean like say the Polynesians uh, did. Uh -huh. um, and so if they, if, if a culture was not seafaring, then they tended to think that the, their patch of land looks pretty flat, right? Relatively mm -hmm. flat. I mean, you know, mountains and hills and valleys, but relatively flat, but with a sphere of stars, then that's the key. And that's, and if, if there's one area where I would love to get you to, to see what I'm trying to explain, it's for you to understand the celestial sphere, which mm -hmm. which literally cannot be a dome, uh, cannot be a uh, a plane, can't be a you know an umbrella shaped. Uh, uh, it, it is well, the Egyptians. Is, they are the ones who who showed the stars above as a person who was standing oh, over the right flat plane. Nut or something. I think the person's yeah, name was Nut. Yeah. But but I mean, you know, that's a that's a nice drawing. But their understanding of the stars was was that they they came they went around the world. Whether they thought Egypt was a little flat disk, they knew the stars went around it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's a very very important distinction. And and I think that's one of the the, the best you know like if you're flat Earth globe Earth uh, uh -huh. debate topics is is what is literally the shape of the celestial map, you know. Uh -huh. Uh, is, yeah. Okay. So you're talking about, uh, I'm trying to think it was the, uh, I've seen a couple like ancient models. Uh, some people would talk about where they have the, the flat horizon and then you have the, the sun going 
over it like that. Yeah, and, I mean, and further yeah. the further closer to your the equator, you know, the uh -huh. the closer that that is. But but um, you know, if somebody and I guess you know the ancient Egypt, uh, I think the equator goes. I, I know Alexandria uh, or Syene, which is which is where um, Eratosthenes apparently did his thing. I mean, that's that's yeah. one of the tropics. So so the the sun does you know kind of go directly overhead on on that on that tropic. But even, you know, a little bit northward, like, for example, the Aztecs, they still believe that that the, 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 the stars were were revolving around kind of like, like in, that in a sphere, uh -huh. you know, like in a sphere like manner, not uh -huh. not well, an that's kind of the way they appear. But, so I would say that would be an evidence uh, for a spherical uh, star map. What do you want to call map. it? You know, yeah. I mean, I would call evidence, it a celestial right. sphere. But, uh -huh. you know, and that's yeah. one of the points my I model, to make. My model acknowledges kind of the reason why they do that. And so, yeah, that's kind of a major thing. But I can see and I can count that as evidence that this could mean that. So, yeah. Um, and John Watson, uh, the uh, I guess is the, uh, the man, his two stick story. Um, I, I will acknowledge, John Watson, that the the Eratosthenes, quote unquote, experiment with two sticks uh it works just fine on a flat earth with a local sun. If, if all you have is two sticks, like if yeah. you not three, but if all you have is two, then, then it doesn't prove that the earth is a globe. But the, the point about the Eratosthenes is that he knew the earth was a globe, right? That was his starting point. He knew the earth was a globe. And then he used that experiment to, to estimate the circumference. Um, yeah, I remember Neil Tyson, he talked about that. Uh, he acknowledged that, well, there are two possible explanations. One is that it could be a globe Earth, and the other one is that it could be a flat Earth. And so he acknowledged that with the two sticks, exactly what you're des describing. I'm assuming you've seen his video on that. Um, uh, it, who's whose video? Because I know Carl Sagan did one like years and years and years ago where he had this Neil deGrasse Tyson. He, he oh, picked okay. up and, on, on that, and he did his own explanation about okay. the Eratosthenes experiment. Yeah. And the thing is, a lot of people don't actually know, like there are certain stories that become folklore, um, like Thomas Edison and the light bulb. You know, it's like the story that everybody tells is actually not the true story about the 10,000 attempts. Um, they're, they're missing like a key point. But that's another that's another topic. But so I think the Eratosthenes story has become folklore and that they think that he actually performed an experiment with two sticks. And it's like he didn't, because when you think about it, how would you travel, you know, 500 miles in two different locations at the same time, at the same moment in, in time, you know, like, yeah. how would you do that? And the, the true story, at least the, the, the story that I think makes most the most sense is he was looking at some old manuscripts in the library. I guess he was like the li chief librarian of Alexandria. And he read about an account at um Syene or Aswan or or whatever the the I think it's Syene is modern day Aswan, which lies right on the on the tropic. And so he just read that, oh, it was it was on the I forget which which solstice, you know, on the solstice, then somebody looked down and they could see the bottom of a well or the, the light shone straight down the bottom of the well, which meant that, you know, at at, at solar noon or you know, local noon. Uh, yeah, I think that was, was one of the, the, the things that really caught my attention is some people describe it as wells and other people describe it as sticks. And that's kind of one yeah. of the folklore things is, yeah, which one so, is it? <laughs> right. So. so when I when I did a deep dive into this story and that it was a couple of years ago, it, it wasn't two sticks at all, because when you think about it, how would how would he do that experiment? There was no there were no cell phones. Right. Uh -huh. And so what I the way I understood it is that you know, everybody knew the date of the solstice. So if the date of the solstice was fixed. Everybody knew that. And he also read in a manuscript that in this one town that was, you know, so many 500 miles away from him on that date at solar noon, the, the sun shone straight down the well. So then he in Alexandria just set up one stick and measured the shadow or even not st stick, but I measured like, you know, maybe from a building, the shadow of a building. Uh, on that solstice, on the same solstice, mm -hmm. and so it's it was one man with one shadow, knowing what was happening on the other, you know, on, on the um on, on on the actual tropic, on mm -hmm. that date, and then that story sounds a lot more reasonable because it's like how would you get two people to measure something at the same time, five hundred miles apart with no cell phone? Yeah, yeah. So so the two stick story doesn't hold up for me. 
but the uh -huh. reading about the well in a in a diary and then setting up a shadow that that makes more sense but backing up from that he didn't do that to prove the shape of the earth and 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 i would argue that that does not prove the shape of the earth that mm -hmm. that that um experiment works just fine on a flat earth as long as you restrict it to two locations and two locations mm -hmm. only it works just fine why on do you earth. say why do you say that i kind of wonder where why you can't why it doesn't work with a third stick because the three lines won't intersect at one point oh, um well, yeah the, i don't expect the three lines to inter intersect at one point and that's kind of part yeah. of the the whole refraction thing in straight lines right 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 and i'm and i'm gonna i'm gonna get to that i i okay. i have a i have a bomb to drop but i have to i have to more make the video but yeah I'll okay tell yeah. You, it's, it's gonna it's gonna rock your world kyle just okay. to wait but you All were right. the inspiration so uh <laughs> i look forward I, to I, seeing that yeah yeah I, I hope to i hope to cause people to kind of think think about things a little bit a little bit differently so we have um we have about five minutes left. I want to keep these things to uh, to under an hour. Um, okay. But uh, let me. Uh, there was a couple of interesting um, uh, quotes. Oh yeah, the um, uh, <laughs> we can't tell the shape of the ground by looking at the sky. Um, yeah, the humans of Earth. Um, it 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 wasn't that. You, you the, the quote is usually you can't tell the shape of the Earth by looking at the shape of the sky. Uh, and I would argue that is that is absolutely true because the shape of the sky is a dome. I've got a whole video on that. Um, the shape of the sky is a dome, period. <laughs> uh, um, but I did a meme. Do... I did a meme recently about that and, and talked about a guy who's like, "Oh yeah, I look it up. Look at the the lights on the ceiling, and because the ceiling is this shape, that totally proves the ground is the same shape." <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, but the, did you see my video? It looks, it looks pretty spherical. To me. Just, did did you look? Did you see my video dome. on the 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 sky is a dome? Uh, I believe I did. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. and I would argue that it's you know the reason why it looks like a dome is that it is one half of the celestial sphere. So, um, but it's very interesting uh, that every single like if you go to a, a solar energy is is really huge. Like pointing a solar panel at the ideal. I mean, the ideal thing is to have a movable solar panel that kind of tracks the sun. But if mm -hmm. if if you have to put a solar panel down and it has to be you know bolted in place, you want to pick the ideal angle. And so solar installers, they know exactly where the sun is every day of the year, every season, whatever. Um, but when you look at their diagrams, they always show a circular disk for the ground. So it's like a flat piece of ground with a with a dome over it. Uh, so it's like, it looks like a little mini flat earth map, you know, but every solar installer and every, you know, professor of astronomy talking about the path of the sun, they always use the same diagram. It's a little piece of flat ground that usually is like a house and a tree, you know, and then it's covered with a, with this dome. Yeah, and then they yeah, show the path of the about, sun. Yeah, the, uh, the thing that textbooks show. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But it's like, they all have different versions of the same diagram. And I would argue that like locally, the earth does appear flat, you know, um, but, but the big picture shows otherwise. Yeah. And that's something I am always looking into and trying to discover more and more about that big picture. All right. So Kyle, I, I would like to wrap it up here. So uh, do okay. you have any final thoughts? And, and what I want to say to our audience is that uh, the various things that I've mentioned, I'm going to try to put links in the description. I, I can't do it right this minute, but you know, if you come back to this video, there'll be links in the description. Uh, uh, I hope to have more conversations with Kyle. I hope to walk through his his flat Earth syllabus. Uh, so this is not going to be the last time we see Kyle. Kyle, do you have any final thoughts for this conversation? No, I think I got everything addressed that I wanted to address. Okay, I uh, and I appreciate everybody in the chat. Like I said, I really was focusing on on, on our conversation with Kyle. And and if I missed your comment, um, I, I do apologize. Um, but but thank you all for for joining us. Uh, thank you, uh, Kyle Adams, for for being such a wonderful guest. And I want to wish everyone a wonderful evening. Good night. Okay. Thank you.